when Tony Hawk shows up at your house, and even the truck driver and the bus driver are really excited to be there. That's a really positive energy, you know. This is such a cool place. You're doing whatever you want to do, you know. One day, the neighbor came over and saw it. And then a year and a half later, ESPN showed up at the house kind of thing. So it's, you know that once one person found out about it, more people are going to find out about it. So you just come to this idea that, okay, why am I trying to hide it? Go ahead and share it. In South Carolina, there's a hidden skate park in the middle of the forest. Unless you're local, have heard the stories, or are lucky enough to know the owner, you would never come across it. He personally opens it up to anyone that wants to come out and enjoy a day of skateboarding. Ten years he has built this entire park with his own money and help of local crews. He has had multiple big name athletes and bands come out to his properties over the years to witness and skate his work. This is the story of Whip Snake and its creator, Tom Risser. I just say, don't let people tell you you can't do something. Don't listen to them. Build it, try it, do it. If you're not hurting anybody else, it's worth it. I am uh, an engineer by trade, but I ended up going a little rogue with the artistic side, so I use both sides of the brain. I make packaging equipment for my real job, which means if you buy baby shampoo, I might have made the machine that puts the shampoo in the, in the bottle. But then I take the leftovers from work, bring them out here to the middle of South Carolina, and make weird stuff like you see here. I've been doing that for about 20 years. We've had this property for maybe 10 years. And originally I was just gonna build a sculpture park on 80 acres. And then about say eight or nine years ago, I got the idea to build a skateboard park that would be real small and something I could do when I retire. And it turned into something huge and something that I'm doing right now. So that's a major distraction, but it's my favorite kind of art because I can skate it. And I started really at this end. I just had this idea that I would create kind of a mogul to a quarter pipe, and I thought, yeah, that'd be fun. It was sort of based on a park in North Carolina called Aviation Park out near the Outer Banks where they have this really cool mogul, and then they launch off a little five-foot quarter, and I thought, I'll do that. What, what happened was I started making the mogul, and it got taller and taller and taller, and the other end got taller and taller, and I thought, I need to do something smaller as well. So. I started off with something that was sort of like four or five foot tall, and then I built something that was just like three foot tall, and then I thought, I'll go mess around with something two foot tall, and then something else four foot tall. And before I know it, it became this park that was probably the biggest one person project ever in concrete, you know. At the end of the multiple years of work, I have over 55 trucks of concrete in this park, which is kind of obnoxious, but really cool too. Um, but, you know, working by myself, I have to come up with tricks to figure out how to do things and let it last for a year or two while I'm constructing. So the way I did it was I made these little metal ribs, like, uh, like you would do a ramp with templates. I did it with metal. Right here, if you can see this, this is a template made out of quarter inch steel. And unlike a ramp, you can still see it because I used it to screed the concrete. In other words, I have one here and another one, say, four foot away across the straight surface, I could take a two by four and run it off of these two planes, these two lines, and I can get this transition to be perfect. I don't break away these later because they're steel. I don't care. I leave them in the system, and then I pick up and go to the next one. There's also rebar running through these templates every 12 inches at three inches deep or 
halfway through a six inch concrete slab. So that ties it all together. Then I stop the template right when I get down to the flat so that I can find where I want the base to be and I don't have a piece of metal coming up. Because these are steel, they do get a little rust on them, but because they're on the wall, they never really rot away because water doesn't sit on them that long. So it's really like an expansion joint. So you can kind of tell with my construction, steel templates allow me to weld the coping on at the top exactly where I want it to be for the reveal. And everything ends up being very accurate for a crew that maybe doesn't understand concrete for a skateboard park. They can understand screeding to a line like this. Also, I can fabricate this and leave it for a year, year and a half while I work on something else. And it doesn't warp, it doesn't rot away. And they're water jet cut, very precision. So I'll have some that are eight foot tranny or eight and a half foot tranny, two foot tall, three foot tall, four foot tall, seven foot tall, eight foot tall, whatever I need. And I just pick and choose as I go. And then I bend my coping appropriately. And basically that's the bones of a concrete skate park using steel. The vert wall is the toughest one. I left it for the end because it's so high in the air and there was really no way to do concrete, say eight foot to 12 foot in the air without any kind of backing on it. So I actually used concrete to go up eight feet tall, but I used steel for the vert. So those are sheets of quarter inch plate. And I put those up there by myself, which that was kind of stupid nuts. So this is one of the templates. You can see it from the side right here. And it goes down and into the concrete. But when I get to vertical right here, I stop the concrete because I don't have any dirt behind it. I did form some steel back here to hold some concrete up, but here, this is straight up and down. So I'm like, well, why do I even need concrete? This is quarter inch steel with the ribbing behind it. So this is just metal. And I had a homemade crane that would hold one up in the air and I would push it until the wind would bring it around. Then I'd catch it, clamp it, put a couple welds on, and I'd be like, that works. So four foot of vert, two pieces of metal, eight foot each wide, gives me a 16 foot wide vert wall that's 12 feet. It is an eight foot tranny, so it does get up pretty quick. So this is the latest and greatest addition, if you will. I don't know, remember three, four years ago? I can't remember when I finished this thing, but um, they're never ever done. I'm always kind of goofing around and adding on. But this was fun to build because it created more lines off the side of the park. And then also I got kind of plowed over in the middle of that park and I realized I needed to go to a place where I wouldn't get run over as much. So this section gives me a chance to revisit my, my youth and do stuff on two foot and two and a half foot tall sections that are really fun actually. I think more parks need to build small stuff too and not just the, you know, the swimming pool that only three guys in the whole town will ride and cost 25, 30% of the project, you know. So yeah, see, on demand, Tyler shows you how to do it. Long before the creation of Whipsnake, Tom gained a lot of popularity from building his personal ramp and bowl on his property. He would have pros like Tony Hawk, Krishna Soy, and Steve Cabulera show up just to skate with him. Well, yeah, it's just if you build it, they will come kind of thing. So, you know, I had the ramp. It was 6,040 square feet. It was sort of considered by Guinness Book World Records for a little while as the largest continuous skateboard ramp. So it sort of had this reputation. On the bus drive from Kona to North Carolina, we got to stop at this amazing guy's house named Tom who uh, went ahead and took the initiative to build his own bowl. The bowl. Oh. The dude's bowl. North Carolina, that guy's house. We veered off the, the beaten path onto a gravel road and uh, showed up at this gated, like, estate. You, would, you thought you were arriving in an estate. Walk up the trail, it's about you know, 300 yard driveway to this, uh, what looked like a horse stable. I just kept hearing, we're gonna go to this guy's private bowl. Holy crap. Sweet. What, what's that? You know, we don't, we don't even know what to expect. When you walk up the track, it doesn't look like that's going to be there. We walk up and there's a bowl. <laughs> and pros would come through. And back in the 90s, you know, a lot of parks were out of business and they didn't have anywhere to go. 
So they would know somebody who knows somebody. And we had a phone number spray painted on the ramp that was sort of the skateboard phone number you could call and find out if we were open. That way people wouldn't show up. Because I, I had trouble once when the Grateful Dead was in town, they all showed up at the house and were like, you know, <laughs> this isn't really a campground. But we would get pros, um, all sorts of guys that would come through town. So one of them told somebody who told somebody, and I got a call from management with ESPN. And they said, send us photographs of your bowl. We might come through on the giant skate park tour. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. That'd be fine if you want to do that. So they eventually um, said they might come through, and I wasn't sure. And one day I came home and their bus was parked across the street in my neighbor's yard and they were walking up the driveway and I was like, I guess they showed up. If we're a little late to a park, it doesn't matter because no one knows we're coming anyway. Sorry we're late, guys. Well, huh? Were you coming? Oh, never mind. It's cool. Um, which is cool. We had them come out. We had HGTV come out. The Navy shot a commercial there. Um, Carolina Traveler came out. I would pretty much avoid any local publicity, but the national stuff was fine because they never really knew where we were. Um, so that was cool. But it's like Michael Jordan coming over and saying he wants to play basketball in your backyard. You know, you're like, you can't believe it, you know. And when Tony showed up, he had, you know, Chalmers was there, Mike V was there, Costin, um, Bucky Lassick, you know, um, Dave Mira. It was pretty epic. Cement was so smooth and just the way that it was all lined up. It was better than a lot of public skate parks that I've skated. Oh my God. I didn't even, didn't even meet Tom yet, you know, we just like, it's just, everyone's just jumping the bowl. Just. And then they put it out on a DVD, and I'm like, what the heck? There's a little menu, and it says Tom's Bowl, and you click on it. <laughs> that was pretty cool. But that guy built that because he loves skateboarding. There's nothing, it's so real. You know what I mean? That's a real skateboarder right there. When I saw the guy, I was like, he skateboards? Like, he doesn't even look like a skateboarder, you know? Popping out like no one's even there, just running into people. He's just a wild man. This is amazing. Like, he, he See, he's probably the only guy that has a bowl like that in his house. So for now, it's there. Those sessions like that are only going to happen in his house. It's on his Giant Skate Park Tour 2003, maybe DVD. If you can find it, yeah, I've got the clip somewhere on YouTube. We had an awesome session there. It was so cool. Nineteen ninety-two, maybe we first opened the ramp. You meet everybody, so you'll have people that have never come out to your property from California, and they were freaking out about the large bugs that we had in, in North Carolina. <laughs> like, why do you have such big bugs? I remember that one. Um, when Tony Hawk shows up at your house, and even the truck driver and the bus driver are really excited to be there, that's a really positive energy, you know. This is such a cool place, you're doing whatever you want to do, you know. I remember Kevin Staub standing there, he's got this hair sticking up, you know, and he's like, you're punk rock, and I'm like, okay, man, that's cool, what do you mean by that? He goes, because you do what you want to do. Um, I put Tony Hawk in a German wheel. I don't know if you know what a German wheel is, but part of it's up there on the wall. It's a giant, basically 10 foot diameter wheel that you can strap in and roll around in. Uh, if you've ever seen Cirque du Soleil, they'll roll around. And I thought, I'm gonna make one of those. So I put it on my tennis court. Tony Hawk shows up and he's like, I wanna try it. So I'm strapping him into this German wheel to roll him down the tennis court. And I'm thinking, this could go horribly wrong. But he had a guy with him by the name of Alex Chalmers, who was a stuntman. And he decides to run over the top of the German wheel while it's rolling with Tony Hawk inside. <laughs> That's some crazy stuff, but pretty cool, actually. Um, I mean, Christmas toys come out a couple times, and Lance Mountain, and Cab, and, you know, they're just find you, you know. Oh, but now there's so many parks, I don't get as many. Like Green Day was going to come one time and they didn't show up and it was like, oh man, that would have been cool. You know? Yeah, when Hosoi came out, 
The first time I'm just in the house, the phone rings and it's one of the skate shops going, hey, Christian, someone wants to come skate. And I'm like, yeah, you know, come out Saturday maybe. And they go, no, he's at the end of your driveway. And it's nine o'clock at night on a Tuesday. And I'm like, what? Let me ask my wife. So I yell up the stairs, hey, Christian wants to come skate. She's like, who? Christian, Christian Asoy. What? Okay. Well, the weirdest thing was I was riding a Christian Asoy deck at the time. So he comes in, I go, dude, I ride your deck. <laughs> he signs it. And he calls up Steve Olson on the phone. He's like, hey man, I'm at this bowl, check this out. I mean, it's like, you can't believe that stuff, you know? And we're skating the bowl at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night, just me and him and uh, the guy from the shop. <laughs> Tom is also known for his sculpture art. Throughout his property, he has sculptures placed and the trail leading through the forest to view them. So yeah, this, this is our skatable sound stage, if you will. We'll have a band play here and we can skate right through them. And we even made little sections for kids to come up and they can bang on stuff. So, you know, I've got all sorts of metal things. Primarily over here, I hung some things on chains. So you can come up and bang on them. Come over here, you take a stick and you can drum on these, you know, and ding, 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 make all sorts of noises. And I like to skate and go by and just hit it every time, boom. But if you get a bass player over here and a drummer on that side and you skate through them and the amps are going, you can feel it right in your chest. That's the ultimate kick turn. <laughs> and, oh, and then here's my band. So, plus you got to have a permanent band on site. So we've got our kind of, I don't know, left-handed Primus bass player. We've got big guitar, big banjo, I call him, singer, and some kind of weird saxophone player with bad hair. And they keep me company whenever the real bands don't show up. These guys are always ready to go. So yeah, this is the first trail. This is just trail, site, sculpture, sculpture, you know, not next to each other, but not that far apart that you can't see where you need to go next. This is, and this one here was the first sculpture I built on site. So this is called Titan 100 because it was done on the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. That day I welded and created this sculpture all in one day. It was the first one I built here at Heartseed Gardens. And it's nice because I do get a lot of kids that just use it as a bench and sit on it but it feels like this is what I wanted to do, is to be able to build something like this, stainless steel, leave it here forever, and then people can come and discover it. It's not going anywhere. The only thing that spooked me was I was up there welding and I was worried if I fell inside the pipe, no one would find me. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure I could have crawled out of there. So um, one day I saw a guy just hang some bamboo up near his house and, you know, it was a wind chime and I thought, hey, I wonder if I could do that out of aluminum. So I found this at the scrapyard, these little aluminum slats, and I drilled holes in all of them and hung them on an aircraft cable. And the idea was to let the kids be able to do something with it. And when it gets windy out here, you can hear them. And then kids, you know, they'll go through it. Yeah, simple, nothing to it, right? Yeah, yeah. No that's welding. The simplest thing, yeah. the most fun. Right, no welding involved. Yeah. But yeah, every now and then the wind will kick up and I'll hear that thing and go, oh yeah, I made that. There's, there's so much stuff. There's literally, I, took, I put a pedometer on one time and I just walked this little trail back to the park. It was a mile and a half. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then other times I get whimsical, you know, like this. This piece is my wood carver, right? So he's a beaver on a surfboard. He's carving the wave, a stump in this case. And, you know, I, I don't know. To be silly and have fun and whimsical as well is great. You know, we don't need to be serious all the time with the art. Just have fun with it. So I know t kids are going to come down this trail sometime and they go, hey, I saw the beaver on a surfboard. And I'm like, cool. Now go see if you can find the monkey that's welding. That's my self-portrait. <laughs> and then this place is community too. 
you know, cell phones don't really work out here, so everybody has to talk to each other and enjoy the experience. And then you've got 80 acres and sculptures, and it's a wonderful community. I think it changes lives, definitely cha changed my life. See, they're having fun right now. <laughs> this is not cookie cutter skate park, so you, you're challenging the skater and the artist and the engineer and everybody and saying, hey, think about it this way, try that, go this way. It's very organic, it's very handmade, it's, you know, it's flowing with the land a little bit. Not everything ends up in the concrete exactly the way you had it in your head, so sometimes the crew will walk off and I'll be over here doing something and I'll be like, oh, I didn't mean for that. Like there's a couple kinks I had to fix and I'm like, oh, I should have been paying more attention. But for the most part, they would follow my lines pretty well. I mean, you spend two years of your life out there digging every inch of dirt and then and when that crew shows up, you're like so stressed that it's gonna be exactly the way you want it. Um, I think the new section is the best thing I've ever built out here for sure because it came closer to what I wanted to do. And the cement's way smoother. You know, that skaters did the concrete, and you can tell. I'm, I'm more southerner now, I suppose, but my roots are from the north. And I remember growing up in Chicago and having nowhere to skate. You had to build your own stuff. And so one of the reasons I wanted to build a public park and then build this park and open it up was because I remember being a young kid and having nowhere to go. And I just thought that's not something I want kids to go through. So let's build them something. Let's do something for them. They don't have a strong voice in town hall at that age. Let's give them a chance to get something that'll, that'll benefit them down the road. I mean, skateboarding probably is why I survived my heart attack because I was in good shape and I was able to recover quickly. So I, I think it lets people see things differently. It opens up their mind. It teaches them about physics and engineering and art and um, exercise and self-confidence and practice makes perfect and all that stuff. So, I mean, the, the negatives of skateboarding are injuries and broken bones, but the positives far outweigh the risk.